listen to Fine Laws Don't Judge Me, the show about the law in real life. I'm Laura Temi, and I'm joined by Andy Leonetti. I, sorry, Hi. I, I, are you gonna not? I, talk to me? I got stuck there on like a howdy or a hi or a it just. <laughs> and, and then I clearly overthink it, Andy. And then I yeah, exactly. I overthink it. I over. And then I just said overthink. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also joined by someone who can't wait for their intro, Vedi Humetta. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, geez. Hello, people. It's good to be back. I We have a really interesting topic ahead of us today. We're going to be talking about John Hinckley Jr. and the insanity defense. So in September of this year, a federal judge approved the unconditional release of John Hinckley Jr., who at the age of 25 attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan in 1981. Although he was immediately apprehended after wounding the president and three others, Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity and spent most of the last 39 years committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington. Five years ago, the courts granted him leave to live with his mother in Williamsburg, Virginia, and after a finding that he poses a low risk for future violence, he'll be released with no conditions in 2022. So we thought this would be a good time to discuss the insanity defense, which has a complicated history and application, and talk about how even a defendant who's been committed might still be released. Now, Andy, you've written quite a bit about the recent decision in Hinckley's case. Can you give us some more background on his crime and trial? Yes, for all of our Gen Zers and <laughs> uh, young millennials, listen. I feel like I have this is like a BuzzFeed headline. Hey, now even mid millennials, a do BuzzFeed not know headline that. like '90s would be presidential assassins that '90s kids just wouldn't know about, or, so, <laughs> or it's something. Very specific. <laughs> <laughs> the story of. Hinckley targeting President Reagan did not start with President Reagan. And the reason he was found not guilty by reason of insanity goes back kind of years earlier. It all starts with the actress Jodie Foster. Yeah. And a plan just to impress her. John Hinckley Jr. first, uh, I guess you could say, fell in love with a 14-year-old Jodie Foster in the movie Taxi Driver. Oh, that's gross. No. He became obsessed with her in uh, kind of beyond the beyond the realm of a normal young person becoming obsessed with a celebrity. To the point where when she became a freshman at Yale University, he moved to New Haven, Connecticut. So from there, there were multiple phone calls, poems slipped under her dorm room door, phone messages, uh, just all sorts of things like that, where he actually did talk to her on the phone a few times. Needless to say, it was all of the grand gestures went uh, un unrequited. Was he significantly older than her? Not terribly. He was a young man. He had been kind of bopping around different colleges for a couple of years and not hadn't graduated from anywhere yet. So he was, and he was 25 when he tried to assassinate Reagan. So he was, you know, early 20s, but. I just looked at it. He is eight years older than Jodie Foster. So when he, so to do the math though, when he saw her in Taxi Driver, he was. She was significantly minor. Illegal. Illegal territory. Correct. So when all of those, all those gestures went unanswered, his obsession kind of spiraled into thoughts of things that he could do to impress her and to get her attention. These uh, things that he thought of included committing suicide in front of her, an airplane hijacking, and then he was inspired by the movie Taxi Driver to try and uh, attempting to assassinate a politician. He settled on then President Jimmy Carter when this was happening, who he... So he followed Carter throughout the uh, throughout the Southeast for on several presidential trips and things like that. Just basically wherever Jimmy Carter was giving a speech or whatever, John Hinckley Jr. was in that city, basically. until he was trying to think of ways to get closer and everything and, until he was arrested on a gun charge. Reagan was incidental to this grand plan to impress... Jodie Foster, a subject which she still pretty much refuses to speak about to this day. Uh, she'll cut off interviews and things like that if, if anyone asks her about it. She does not 
She does not enjoy talking about it. The what he was leave President Reagan was leaving the Washington Hilton. It was a pretty it was pretty easy to get up to the front of the crowd on a rope line and stick a gun out and start firing. And Reagan was only hit on the ricochet of a bullet. He he struck a DC cop, a Secret Service agent, press secretary James Brady, and then Reagan was hit on a ricochet. But it was an attempt, and which is um, just as illegal as an actual successful uh, committed crime, um, which I can go into a little bit. So actually not even that long beforehand, in response to JFK's assassina- assassination, so that would be in 63, the United States, well, Congress passed a law making it a federal offense, punishable by not just life imprisonment, but also death, capital punishment to assassinate not just the president, but president-elect, vice president, vice president-elect, or anyone sort of legally acting as president. And um, also later, an elected member of Congress. Um, And that includes threatening the president. So that's also a federal felony. So um, if it's not related to these people in office, it's Assassination is sort of a common crime that would otherwise be dealt by this with the state government or the government whose jurisdiction it occurs. But because these encompass, you know, president, vice president, uh, and it, such federally significant political positions, it is then a federal offense if it's certain positions that are in federal power. I love how it's an extra crime. To, to it's it's one of those funny it's one of those funny things where it's like <laughs> you murdered someone, you already did something highly illegal. Extra crime. But it, it just happens to be like a special someone, so it's extra illegal. We're not gonna. Are we? Are they gonna give you more years, though, Laura? Do you know? Oh, I would. I would imagine. Yeah. But like, why? Well, yeah. It's like how some jurisdictions have separate statutes for if someone kills a police officer. You know, as a society, we've. I guess, or as a criminal justice system, at least, we've decided that certain types of murder call for a more serious punishment. Yeah. Or hate, 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 hate crime crimes. Yeah, is another good example. But isn't it kind of like messed up that we elevate certain people or positions over others to where like it almost seems like as a society we're saying this person matters more. Therefore, you will get more punished if you kill. I think that's a conversation bigger than this podcast. <laughs> right, right. Actually, yeah, it does. It does quite seem antithetical to the views that the founders had of who should wield power in this country. But yeah, uh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting a little too philosophical here. <laughs> We're here to talk about the insanity defense. (laughs) Yes. So John Hinckley goes to trial. The defense argues that John Hinckley Jr. was suffering from schizophrenia. Prosecutorial psychiatric witnesses also attested to schizophrenia, dysthymia, and a whole host of other mental health problems. Needless to say, though, as he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, the nation looked on horrified and demanded that something be done. And it hadn't been an easy trajectory getting to that place because right around this time is when the country was going through lots of different questionings and reforms and back and forths as to what should constitute the insanity defense. Yeah, one one really interesting thing about all this is that there still is no single rule for the insanity defense. The states all have their own version that are based on different older, some very old tests and some newer um, or different combinations of them. Yeah. The test that was used at Hinckley's t- trial was the one of the earlier tests called the ALI test, which is the American Law Institute. So back around the 50s, there was a group of legal and medical professionals, the American Law Institute, ALI, and that they started studying criminal responsibility and they drafted this um, insanity test for the model penal code in the 60s. Um, and so at that time, the majority of states were following the model penal code. Um, and of course, the model penal code is just what it sounds like. It's like a model criminal code that states can make their own state law codes match if they want to. They can use it as a model. At the time, the majority of states were, were doing that. Um, and that included the federal court. So because the federal courts were also following model penal code, the ALI test was used 
in federal courts. He was tried in federal court, so the ALI test was used for his trial. It attempted to solve the problems that came with earlier insanity tests. And Laura, what were some of these earlier insanity tests that we were finding problematic? I would love to tell you. I love talking about the history of I mean, anything, but also I, I had a lot of, I had, I have some fun stories to share with you guys as I go through the history of the insanity (laughs) defense. So, (laughs) so yeah, one of the most famous tests is uh, known as the Monoton test. Oh, date back. It dates back to the mid 19th century in England. Daniel Monoton was charged with murdering the British prime minister's secretary, Edward Drummond, after mistaking him for the prime minister himself. And <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah, so basically he just straight up killed the wrong guy. Okay. And there was evidence that he believed that people were following him and suffered from some other delusions. And uh, at the time, the, the people who would handle this type of thing was the House of Lords. And they, they, in their opinion, they released what became the Monoton Test, where they said that in order to establish an insanity defense, the accused must clearly prove that the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of mind not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or if he did know it, that he did not know what he was doing is wrong. So in non-mid-19th century British language, that (laughs) that is, it, it boils down to three things. One, the defendant has a mental illness. And that mental illness causes them to either not understand that their criminal act was wrong or to not understand what they were doing at the time of the offense. An example of this would be, say, let's say when Andy and I used to work in the office together, he one day just like jumped over my cube and started viciously attacking me because he was convinced I was a demon. Now, Andy could mount a pretty good insanity defense under the monoton rule, if he can prove that he, due to mental illness, genuinely believed that I was not a human being. Well, I can prove with scientific evidence that that's true. <laughs> that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm not a human being? <laughs> oh, I walked right into that one, didn't I? As the years went on and the, these tests kind of developed, the courts in the United States came up with the irresistible impulse test, which kind of pushes monoton a little bit further and held that the law should not only acquit a person for not knowing their act was wrong, but also if someone who is unable to prevent themselves from committing their their criminal act despite knowing that it's wrong because of their mental illness, um, that that also should be subject to the insanity defense. So the theory was that mental disease could force someone to act against their will or be driven by an irresistible impulse, which is where the name comes from. As you can imagine, you know, there's some issues with that and... People had a pretty hard time defining what was an irresistible impulse. How how do we determine if someone actually has that? So then we ended up with the Durham test, which provides that a person is not criminally responsible for an unlawful act if it is the product of a mental disease or defect. So the jury had to answer two questions. One, do they have a mental illness? And if so, was that the reason for their crime? And if both answers are yes, then they have to return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. And there was a lot of back and forth between which of these tests was right. And the ALI, the American Legal Institute, kind of tried to dig into all the things that were wrong with previous tests that people were pushing back on. And as a result, sort of combined, like kind of cherry picked the the, the most logical parts of the earlier test and, and tried to get rid of the parts that didn't make so much sense. And ultimately ended up sort of combining the monoton test and irresistible impulse test. So the ALI test uh, basically implemented psychiatric advances as well, because there had been more research into a little bit more research into psychiatric studies. It also kind of avoided the causation problems that the Durham test brought up. Um, Because again, Durham test had asked that second question, was the disease or defect the reason for the unlawful act? Sounds like that's going to be hard to answer or know sometimes. So the ALI just did a side with that causation requirement. Um, And instead, it broadened the insanity test to also include a volitional, irresistible impulse as well. So it focused on more of the defendant's understanding of his conduct and also on his the defendant's ability to control his actions. So it kind of pieces together all these all these tests. And at the Hinckley trial, this is what was used. So when he was under trial federally in federal court, the, um, under the ALI test, the burden was on the government to prove beyond reasonable doubt, of course, that the defendant was not insane um, once there was evidence presented to raise the issue. And under that test, it, the government didn't present enough evidence. So then in June 
1982, the verdict was read not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah. And a little fun fact I found when uh, reading about this case is that in the wake of this verdict, more than 30 states made changes to their insanity defense laws to make it to make it basically harder to achieve an acquittal by by reason of by reason of insanity and Montana, Idaho and Utah abolished the insanity defense altogether. Yeah, it was the the public outrage over Hinckley's acquittal that ultimately led to the passage of the Insanity Defense Act of 1984, um, which significantly changed the standard for federal cases and made it much more difficult to achieve a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, which I do want to point out that the, the insanity defense has never been easy. Before Hinckley, the insanity defense failed in about 75% of cases, dating all the way back to the attempted assassination of Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. That one... <laughs> Here's another fun insanity defense story for you. Um, Richard Lawrence, the the house painter who attempted to shoot President Jackson. You're going to like this one. I enjoy any story that uh, <laughs> involves Andrew Jackson being inconvenienced or annoyed. <laughs> yeah, or... yes, exactly. God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, his attempted assassin, one of the delusions that he suffered from was that he was actually England's Richard III. And because of that, believed that he owned two English states and that he was owed money. And so in kind of a convoluted way, he thought that President Jackson stood in the way of his income because of his opposition to the Second Bank of the United States. But my favorite part of the story is that when he attempted his the assassination, he waited for Jackson to leave the funeral of a South Carolina representative and... (laughs) <laughs> but when the time came, his pistol misfired twice. And then Jackson turns around and starts beating the guy with his cane. And then, I'm not kidding, this is actually what happened. Davy Crockett, the Davy Crockett, <laughs> tackled this guy to the ground. Just happened to be casually <laughs> in the same bar. Just, with a- well, yeah. no, he, no, he was, um, Davy, <laughs> um, Davy Crockett was a, was a representative at that time. So he was also attending the funeral. Did he smack the guy with his coonskin hat? <laughs> <laughs> All, yeah, he he straight up he yeah physically took him down and yeah the jury in that case ultimately found Lawrence um, not guilty by reason of insanity and he spent the remainder of his life in an asylum yeah so that's a little bit crazy to me no pun intended uh, because <laughs> because the guy thought he was what Richard the the third, the third. or whatever um, that's specific but, mm-hmm. but he's but he but he yeah. so so sure he had a delusion but even if his delusion was real he would still be killing somebody so even under his delusion he would be committing a crime yeah it's it's a strange one and not in self-defense yeah yeah but in that case the insanity defense did work one case that i find a lot of fun that where the insanity defense did not work was the 1941 mad dog murders where brothers anthony and william esposito killed two people in manhattan during a robbery and they attempted an insanity defense going as far as Walking into the courtroom like apes, howling, drooling, eating their attorney's notes during the trial. And this was all disingenuous. They were putting on a show in order to get the insanity defense. Come on, guys. Come on, bros. You got to be a little more subtle. You're overdoing it. You got to be more subtle. Exactly. (laughs) You got to want it a little less. (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, they were so they were dubbed the Mad Dogs by the media. And oh my god! But my, my favorite part of this is that, but the jury didn't buy any of it. And uh, <laughs> what is apparently a a record in the United States, the the jury convicted them after one minute of deliberation. <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> <laughs> a unanimous like, jury after one yep, minute. That's awesome. <laughs> they were like, no, I love absolutely that, absolutely not. And as Andy alluded to, it's been getting harder, or it's been easier and easier to just completely scrap the insanity defense for states, uh, especially given last year, SCOTUS ruled in a case called Kaler v. Kansas that states are essentially okay to do away with the insanity defense if they want to, because there the court upheld a Kansas law that essentially allows consideration of mental status only at the sentencing phase of trial, um, as opposed to at the, you know, the the mens rea phase where you're seeing if someone is guilty or not. Wait, could you define the term mens rea? Is that how it's? Mens rea. It's our fake Latin. (laughs) It means, oh dear Lord. Love, love, love explaining a, a, a fake dead language. Okay. So mens rea and actus reus mean mens is, is the mind and rea is like, I think guilty. I don't know. I made that up. 
Is that is that right, Laura? Yeah, is it no, guilty minds? From what I remember, yeah. Okay, versus actus reus, which is like the guilty act, right? So crimes require both a mens rea and an actus reus. So you have to want to have done a crime or okay. want to have done something bad or illegal, but you mm-hmm. also have to actually do the act. You can't accidentally do a bad act, kind of, essentially, that's the theory. And then mm-hmm. you can't just want to do it, but not act on it. And, you know, this isn't a minority report where you're going to be punished for for <laughs> having a future right. thought crime, right? You got to yeah. act on it in some way. Anyway, so going back to this Kansas law, though, so under this Kansas law that SCOTUS held up, a jury is not supposed Supposed to consider mental disease or mental defect as a defense, except to the extent that it shows that the defendant lacked the mens rea, aka mental state, that is required as an element of the offense charge. And remember, crimes require mens rea, a mental state, and an actus reus, some kind of affirmative, like some kind of action. The, def- the if the defendant lacks one or the other, if they def- they lack the mental state because they're if they're in, like insane, then they don't have the requisite man- mental state, that's a defense to a crime. If the jury can't consider that as a defense to a crime until the sentencing phase... Then essentially it's not a defense. Wow, okay. Exactly. Although the majority in SCOTUS reasoned that there's still an insanity defense that's left here because while the Kansas law that was at issue does make irrelevant the question of moral incapacity, it still permits mental illness as a defense to culpability if it prevented the defendant from forming the criminal intent required for the commission of the crime. It's a little convoluted, right? I'm about to pass out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it, it's similar to one of the things that was included in the Insanity Defense Act in the mid 80s was one of the things that that law did was limit the scope of expert testimony um, related to insanity defense where under so federally an expert witness can't state an opinion on whether the defendant did or didn't have the mental state required by an element of the crime or an element of the insanity defense. So, I mean, what that means in a less obnoxious way <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's just that if, if say, uh, you know, they have a psychiatrist on the sand, the defense can't say in your expert opinion, did the defendant's mental illness cause them to be unable to know that what they were doing was wrong? They can't say that they instead have to, in a more roundabout way, introduce evidence that would help the jury reach that conclusion. But they, yeah, they can't ask that question, which makes it really hard to introduce evidence yeah. in any other way. Um, and and the majority were like apparently comfortable with this ruling in Kansas because they said that there's not a single particular version of the insanity defense that is so fundamental that it must be required um, as a sort of constitutional right or what what have you. And Justice Breyer dissented. He said that you know the Kansas law didn't just redefine the insanity defense, it eliminated the core of a defense that is, quote, so rooted in the traditions and conscious of our people as to be ranked as fundamental, unquote. So like, there's basically an argument about almost sort of a constitutional fundamental right to this defense that's, that SCOTUS does not have a consensus on. But um, Hinckley, Going back to him, he was released unconditionally? He will be next year. The way it works is he was not given unconditional release at the moment of his hearing um, last month. It was he was given, he is given basically nine months for the Justice Department to kind of do some final monitoring and make sure that he adheres to his conditions still and things like that. But at this point, there is no objection from the federal government that he goes free of state supervision next June. Okay. Because an unconditional release, I guess once he's actually on an unconditional release, that would be, you know, that's when an inmate is released without the supervision of... Totally, he's a free man. No parole officer, no follow-up check-ins, as opposed to, you know, parole where the release where the inmates release before their court ordered prison sentence has fully been served um under supervision of the probation office or whatever um or a supervised release which is sort of an additional term of supervision that has to be completed after a person completes their term yeah and to be 
clear here he's not on he's he's i mean it's it is very similar to the parole and probation process even though like let's not forget he was acquitted this whole time Mm -hmm. he was acquitted but he's still been essentially a a ward of the state for 40 years for Mm -hmm. 40 years because of his alleged insanity not because of his alleged guilt yes right because he was found not guilty he was found not guilty and he's he's basically had a um it's been a long process with him in the late 80s i believe it was he had first petitioned for supervised release and an investigation found that he had um he was still like very obsessed with jody foster um he had been exchanging letters with uh ted bundy what? yeah i'm sorry <laughs> i think my brain just broke and his petition was very quickly denied but then it was it was 99 was when he was first allowed to leave the hospital for supervised visits with his parents and then since 99 it was a gradual um it was supervised visits with his parents then it was his parents were the supervisors um and then it was in 2016 when he was released from St. Elizabeth's and he was allowed to live with his mother and then in 20 and then in 2018 he was allowed to move out of his mother's house. Um, and so this next nine month period, what I, what I forgot to mention is that his mother recently passed away. Um, and so the justice department wants to see if he can still maintain the way he has been maintaining Mm -hmm. without his mother in the picture. Um, because he was living, he was allowed to move out of his mother's house, but he was living close by. Um, but the funny thing is, and it's really not funny. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about this because because uh, what it's called forensic confinement i learned is the name of the term um as compared to civil confinement which is um for someone who's found not guilty but then is involuntarily confined it is it's not getting off easy yeah it is not um beating the system mm-hmm. i read a new york times story from a couple of years ago in uh, researching this episode that we will include in the show notes, basically goes into the fact that um, forensic commitments are likely to last for at least five to seven years, whereas a civil commitment with the same diagnosis is around 30 days. Wow. The federal government does not keep any data on how many people are subject to this type of confinement. Some estimates have have put it at, at about 10,000 people and the process of getting out is extremely difficult. In fact, for tr- like it's been for like 20 years both government in the Hinckley case for the last 20 years, govern both government and Hinckley's psychiatrists, therapists have attested to the fact that his diagnosis and his mental illness was has been in remission and then to the point the last few years where he's basic where he is viewed now as cured and suffering from no delusions and he takes you know responsibility for what he did um, understands what he did understands the gravity of what happened and um, why he cannot reoffend um, but if you're found not guilty by reason of insanity and then confined it is very hard to escape confinement Mm -hmm. each state has its own process um but you are subject to the whims of judges prosecutors state psychiatrists all sorts of different depending on the state where you are confined um the judge still orders you to be confined right but it's just easy it's just shorter and easier to get out of quicker is that yeah usually well well most likely there's not a crime attached a murder or a sexual assault or anything like that attached to it is the thing it's this whole kind of view of it's a whole still very like punitive view of you need to pay some sort of price for what you've done and and there's never been any motivation for prosecutors politically to let someone like john hinckley jr out and but the fed but the judge overseeing hinckley's case just last month acknowledged the fact that he has made so much progress over the last 15 years or so that if he had if he had shot anyone else other than the president he would have been he would have been given his unconditional release a long time ago Mm -hmm. because of how well he's he's done and i just i I let my politics shine through a little bit when i talk (laughs) about something like this but it is i just want to say it is not beating the rap john hinckley jr did not beat the rap it's different than getting out on good behavior when you're guilty he he was subject to very 
strict conditions um, to the point where he couldn't even he could not even erase his computer's web browser history. Wow. Would be a violation of of his supervised release. Um, He could not could not visit the homes, past homes or graves of any presidents. Oh, wow. Could not access. He could not access any violent movies, TV, music, anything like that. Which is a lot more restrictive than typical, you know, even supervised releases Mm -hmm. of people who are not found to be insane. It sounds like he's earned it he works he you can you can see videos of him i was uh, gonna say yeah he's got a youtube channel singing bob singing bob dylan songs on youtube he received permission to monetize a youtube channel and the first assassin or would-be assassin of a united states president to experience freedom yeah it just goes to show that this the well the insanity defense on its own is a very complicated area of law and yeah, it's I, yeah. To your point, Andy, it's important to keep in mind that you know, if, even if someone is found to be either guilty or not guilty by reason of insanity, that doesn't mean that that condition is permanent. And yeah, it can it can change with um, with treatment. And that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fine Laws Don't Judge Me. Please subscribe to, rate, and review our show wherever you listen to podcasts. Check the show notes for related content. And if you'd like to contact us, send us an email at findlawpodcasts at thompsonreuters.com. Set phasers to stone. (laughs) 